issues. We want to talk about all of that here today on Viewpoint. It's a tall order. And to help us with the conversation, I've invited Carl Gallops to join us back on the program today with his brand new book, Be Thou Prepared. Sounds like an instruction, Carl. Yeah, well, it really is. And listen, I couldn't have done a better job of introducing it. That's some good preaching, Chuck. <laughs> all right. You mean a, a lawyer can preach? I guess. Well, you know, and I'm a pastor and have been one for many years, so perhaps I should try to be a lawyer. I don't know. Yeah, well, you put the two together, and uh, you can plead the ultimate cause. How's that? Yeah, well, not only that, before I, was in the, before I was in the ministry, I was a Florida law enforcement officer for 10 years. So between those three professions of ours and, and God's calling upon our life, maybe we can get something done today. Well, I, I trust that we can, and it requires some rather plain talk. Uh, it requires that we speak the truth in love, but that we also speak the truth in ways that people cannot miss it. And therein lies the problem, because we're having to deal with things, uh, to say things that people really uh, fundamentally don't want to hear. Yeah, no, you're right, and that's the, re that's the reason I wrote the book, Chuck, is because I do have over 30 years of ministry experience dealing in people's lives and disasters and heartache and tragedy, uh, literally, I mean very, very literally, and then prior to that, as I just said, 10 years in Florida law enforcement mm -hmm. with two different sheriff's offices and dealing with disasters and tragedies and traumas of people's lives. So 40 yeah. years of life experience. And that's why I wrote the book, because I, I want people to know that, look, I know, I know that you have tough questions. You have dozens of tough questions. And I've tried to answer every one of them from a biblical standpoint in, in, in this book, using my 40 years of experience in dealing in them. Well, there are a lot of people, though, who have this idea that faith is fatalism. Uh, in other words, we should adopt an attitude uh, like the old song, K sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, K sera, sera. So we sit and we uh, twiddle our spiritual thumbs and we kick back and we say, I'm trusting God. Is there a place to be a doer of the word, to be a preparer while also equally trusting God? Yeah, an excellent question and excellently put, Chuck. There's a balance to all of it, as, as you know, and, and I'm sure most of your audience knows what I'm going to say. I just want to remind them of it again. Uh, first of all, of course we live by faith. Of course we do. Faith is the foundation of our life. And I don't care how much preparation one does, whether it's uh, spiritual, mental, emotional, or physical preparation. You can store up food and water in a barn, for example, uh, against the day of disaster, mm -hmm. and the barn can burn down. Yeah. You know. So, so the bottom line is every day is a day of faith. The next yeah. breath we take, the next beat of our heart, of course. But, well, you could, but, you could also store up silver and gold you could get all the gold coins and the silver coins and the platinum coins or whatever and they could all get involved in an intense emt fire and melt down to the ground well of course and that's the point is that every day is a day of faith ultimately that's our foundation however however there's clear biblical instruction old and new testament uh, that instructs God's people to be prepared, not only mm -hmm. spiritually and emotionally, and 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 uh, uh, but but also physically, uh, to 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 make preparations for life. And so, when people say to me, "Well, you know, I'm just going to trust in the Lord," and my response to that is, "Well, look, what do you do about those scriptures that command us to make preparation?" I mean, in the Old Testament, it says, "Go to the ant, you sluggard." Even the <laughs> ant, even 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 the ant stores up for the winter, mm -hmm. you know. And then, what do you do with a scripture that says, "Look, the wise person sees danger coming and prepares for it and is spared, but the fool mm -hmm. sees danger coming." And and does nothing and is consumed by it. Or and what do you? I'll, or what do you do with the Apostle Paul's words uh, to Timothy, saying, you know, if a man will not work, he should not eat, and that a person is responsible to take care of their own family first, no matter what the situation. We're supposed to take care of our own family. Sounds like an instruction. Oh, it is absolutely, uh, Chuck, and I deal with all of that in my book and give uh, practical examples of it. And the other thing I try to remind uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with this issue of, well, am I being less faithful 
if I if I make these preparations, if I store up a little food, if I store mm -hmm. up a little water, if if I make preparations for emergencies and disasters, yeah. am I somehow being less faithful? And my answer is, well, listen, let me ask you some questions. Do you All right, we're going to get to those questions when we get back after this break, friends. Be thou prepared. We live in unbelievable times. These are biblical times. They're stirring times, and as you well know, they're increasingly perilous times. But the same Lord that you and I serve issues a command to his people that we are to be prepared. We're to be prepared spiritually. We're to be prepared physically. We're to be prepared emotionally. We're to be prepared in every single way. And at the foundation of those preparations is attitude, not just action, but attitude. And that may very well provide much of the differentiation from whether we're preparing in fear or preparing by faith. What do you think, Carl? Yes, no, absolutely, uh, Brother Chuck. And, and, you know, just before we went to the break, I was making the point to add on to what you're saying, is that when uh, when a believer, a brother and sister in Christ, who's struggling with this issue of is it somehow less faith, an act of faith on my part, when I make these preparations, am, am I somehow not just trusting in God? My answer is to them, I say, think about this. Do you Do you have insurance policies? Do you lock your doors at night? Do you have a spare tire in your trunk? You know, do, do you get medical physicals? Do, do you brush your teeth? <laughs> do, you, do you, you know, I mean, and I ask people these questions. Do you have a burglar alarm? Do you have a fire extinguisher anywhere around you? Hmm. Do, some of you do, you, do you own a firearm? Do you have some type of personal protection weapon maybe around the house? I mean, and I ask brothers and sisters in Christ, look, of course you do these things. Why are you doing them? Well, you're doing them to prepare. What are you preparing for? For the possibility of the need for insurance, for the possibility of a flat tire, for the possibility of somebody trying to break into my home. Okay, well, are you being less faithful? Why don't you just trust in God? Do you, do you grocery shop? Well, of course I do. Well, how long do you grocery shop for? Well, I sometimes grocery shop for a month. Really? Why don't you just quit grocery shopping and the food will just show up on your front porch? Aren't you just trusting in God? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, you've made your point, Carl, I think. Uh, at least well, you're coming close to it. it. Well, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. Well, the point is, is not to be cute or sarcastic. Right. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I just want people to understand that life Every day of life is a, is, is a time of preparation. We're always in a state of preparation. And I don't mean wringing your hands in anxiety. That's another reason I wrote this book. This book is balanced. It's written from the point of view of a pastor, a former mm -hmm. law enforcement officer. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I mean, I've got a lot of life experience. I'm very level-headed. I've been the pastor of one church for 29 years on the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. My people know me. They know that I'm a very balanced, reasonable person. And I wanted people to have a balanced, reasonable reasonable, biblical understanding of this whole issue, everything from natural disasters mm -hmm. to, as you said, perhaps end-of-day scenarios that the Bible speaks of. It's well, so, we had it, one of those illustrated in Genesis chapter 6 to 9. God told yes, Noah, build an ark, and uh, the people had no clue what was coming, but God did. It's probably the longest single preparation on earth that we have ever known of to prepare for disaster, and it was also both physical physical and spiritual, and it took Noah 120 years to prepare. So uh, we don't even have that long of a lifetime, generally speaking, so we need to get with it. Uh, it may take 120 days. It may take 12 months. It may take who knows how long. We, we do it one step at a time as the Lord uh, reveals to us the kinds of things that we should do. And interestingly, Carl, uh, it was just a few days ago that my wife and I were sitting uh, in the morning, as we always do, with our coffee and the Bible. And uh, we have done this for year upon year upon year, every morning, no matter what happens. And uh, we're spending time in the Word, and then we discuss it, and we uh, pray over the things that God brings us to our minds. And we were discussing this very issue of preparing for these times. Uh, we have done preparations uh, in the past uh, and kind of uh, slipped off some of those preparations. And so we're kind of reiterating now to ourselves, okay, what would God have us to do at this juncture 
of our lives, of our particular financial situation, and so on. What should we do? What should we do to be about the Father's business? And I think that if people would take this seriously and not think because they're an American uh, or because we have promises from God that somehow uh, we are uh, somehow walled off from every eventuality of life, we might just uh, begin to uh, take some active care. What do you think? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and that's that's what I'm trying to do, uh, my friend and brother, is to just wake the church up, to wake God's people up, because we've had it so good in America, and I pray we have many more good years, but, but I don't know. Things are changing mm-hmm. so rapidly around the world. They're changing in our nation. I'm not an alarmist, and this book is not written in an alarmist fashion. Again, mm-hmm. it's very balanced, very biblical, very calm, but I'm doing what you just said, and that yeah. is to try to help God's people understand, look, there, there are reasonable, rational ways to do this, and very and very inexpensive ways. I, mm-hmm. You don't have to go out and buy $3,000 worth of food buckets in one day. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you know, just when you go to the grocery store, buy buy extra non-perishable food. Have a little mm-hmm. food closet. L- mm-hmm. Listen, here's I live on the Gulf Coast. I live in Hurricane Alley. I've been through Katrina and through Ivan and through Dennis and the devastation. I've been days and days and days without law enforcement, without power, without grocery stores. Did you build gas- an ark? Yeah, almost. We needed to. <laughs> and and, and the, the point I'm making is, but I had prepared, and, and I tell, you know, Christians say, yeah, but how much should I do? I don't want to look like a crazy prepper. And I said, well, then don't look like a crazy prepper. Prepare at least for whatever natural disaster your area is prone to. Mm-hmm. If it's hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or fires or snowstorms, whatever, and just make preparations, have yourself uh, food and water and clothing and those kinds of things uh, that would last for, for several days, maybe several weeks if you got in a tight spot. And then you can do that easily by just every time you go to the grocery store, buy a little mm-hmm. extra this, a little extra that. And, you know, in the food and, and the preparation industry now, is we're really blessed because you can buy a 3,000-calorie food bar that'll last for 15 years, you know, <laughs> and pour it away. I mean, you can literally, you can literally, uh, you know, uh, equip yourself very reasonably and very mm-hmm. easily. So, so th- that's just one of the things I deal with. In the all book. right. Well, but, here we've got recommendations. We've got recommendations all the way from a minimum of 72 hours preparation of food and uh, water and shelter and uh, uh, medical uh, care, just fundamental things, all the way up to a, to three months at least. Uh, most recently, uh, the inter- information that I've received coming even from the Department of Homeland Security is that we ought to be prepared for three months at least. So yeah. uh, somewhere in that vicinity, you're looking at the realm of reason based upon the evidence that's before us. Yes, absolutely. And that's well stated. Listen, I've, I've gone to some very solid, reputable uh, sources and sites that are even suggesting with the technology we have now, mm-hmm. it's, it would not be difficult at all to prepare for a year. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, people say, oh, that's too much. Well, it may not be too much if the worst-case scenario happens. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, again, again, I'm not an alarmist, but, I, right. but so many people here's – the, here's the problem, Brother Chuck. So many churches, so many people, so many Christians are not prepared at all. So many pastors aren't even speaking or preaching or teaching this stuff, and it's mm-hmm. all biblical. It's very biblical. Right. The early church had to deal with this. Yeah. I start the book off by talking about – the days of the early church, they had mm-hmm. to deal with famines and earthquakes and persecution and, and attacks and being thrown mm-hmm. to the lions. And, yep. and, and you know, and, and Paul was taking up collections for the, other, for, the, for the church in Jerusalem because they were going through tough times. And the mm-hmm. church learned early on to prepare and to, to, and to take care of themselves and to take care of each other. And here's the key. And here's the key to the whole book. And here's the key to the Word of God. The reason Christians prepare is not so we can go hide under a log somewhere, yep. but so that when the day of disaster comes, whether it's a hurricane or a worst-case scenario, that when we are prepared and our family is secure, as mm-hmm. the Bible tells us we should, then that means the very next day we are free to minister the love of Jesus Christ to the mm-hmm. world around us, and that's what's important. Well, that's what God said to Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you, and you through all the families of the earth be blessed. You're blessed to be a blessing. 
And uh, so it's not to hide out, it's not to hunker down, but rather to be a blessing. God wants us not to be a reservoir, but a kingdom conduit so that we can uh, allow his provision, his blessing, his spirit, uh, his power to flow through us. Uh, in us and through us to an unbelieving generation. And it may be that this uh, this plus the spirit of hospitality uh, may be the most potent ministry tools that we have in this generation. Yes, Chuck. Can I give a quick anecdotal illustration of that truth? Go for it. Okay. As I said, I live on the Gulf Coast. When Hurricane Ivan hit, the, the worst part of that storm hit our area head-on, 163 mile an hour sustained wind, 190 mile an hour gust for a day and a half. It was absolutely devastating to our area. When finally the wind subsided to where we could go outside, everything was destroyed. Power lines were down, trees were down, roads were blocked, law enforcement was non-existent, gas stations, grocery stores, everything down for days and days, power off for weeks, homes destroyed. But I took an assessment because we had been preparing, and I had enough food and water in one closet that would last us for months if we were careful with it. And I looked. Our home was okay. We had clothing. We had food. We had water. We had our medical supplies. I was prepared. So the next thing I did, my son, who's grown, has a four-wheel drive truck. He was with us. We loaded up his truck. We got food and water. We got chainsaws. And we started cutting our way through the mess, and we started going house to house, ministering to people, helping people, uh, people who weren't prepared. And we did that for days, and our church was prepared. We became a FEMA staging area for food and water and shelter, and we led people to the Lord left and right. We blessed our whole community because Mm -hmm. we were prepared. Well, it's interesting because uh, that's exactly what happened in the Roman Empire with the early church, persecuted to the max, martyred, and so on. But they continued to minister, continued to minister, and absolutely, through that ministry, broke the bondage of the Roman emperors and laid the foundation for uh, Constantine to actually uh, embrace the Christian faith for the empire. There are more, there's more to it than that, but uh, that's a lot uh, that was going on there. Friends, the book is called Be Thou Prepared, Equipping the Church for Persecution and Times of Trouble. Again, I welcome you back to Viewpoint. We're talking about some very practical things today, as well as uh, spiritual preparation for difficult times. I want to go back with our special guest, uh, Carl Gallups, to the early church right now. Uh, The early church uh, did not have pleasant times. Uh, It was a very, very difficult time. In Jerusalem, the persecution arose so severely that uh, Christians were driven uh, out into the Gentile world, and uh, it was it was just a tremendous persecution that arose. Uh, you might say almost a confederation between Rome and the uh, the Jewish leaders uh, that despised the followers of the way, and so they got it, the double whammy persecution, and it was not pleasant. So, in the context of that kind of persecution, which, by the way believe it or not, is rising all over the world and even in this country. It is happening. It's rising very rapidly. In fact, in the last seven years, we have watched it accelerate at breathtaking speed, removing our religious freedoms and so on. So don't think we're we're somehow set apart from all this. So let's go back to the early church, Carl, and take a quick look again at what was going on there and what the people did how the apostles helped them to prepare for those difficult times. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question and an excellent analysis to do. Um, I do it uh, very in-depth in my book, but let me do it quickly here. Uh, yes, it, it, as you so beautifully set it up, uh, the early church, I want to remind your listeners, I'm sure they know this, but I want to remind them that for the first two decades of the church, they, they were primarily Jewish. The, the first right. Christian were Jews. They weren't and even called was, Christians. No, exactly. And, and and not until the persecution started and, and some of them moved up into Antioch area, mm-hmm. and that's where they were first called Christians. But, but the, the point is 
that the the early church for the first several decades were Jewish, all right, until the Apostle Paul received his vision from the Lord to really begin to reach out to the Gentiles. And even then, Peter, he had to go to the elders to convince the elders of the church, Peter, James, and John, that this should be done. And even they kind of fought it. They just couldn't, they didn't have this broader vision that the salvation of Christ was for everyone. But it finally caught on, and finally they started receiving Gentiles into the church. But here's the point. For the first 20 years, these Jews were being kicked out of their homes, Chuck. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were losing their jobs. Their families were disowning them. Um, uh, it, and if you were a woman and you became widowed and you were a believer in Christ and your family had disowned you, uh, what would you do? Well, we read the early church mm-hmm. in, in, in the book of Acts. They're feeding the widows, and, and, and they're trying to help. Uh, you're, you, you read in the book of Acts of... of of uh, members taking up collections for each other. Some of the more wealthy ones were selling what they had and 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 bringing it to the church. Well, wait a minute, divided. wait a minute, Carl. They didn't make an application to the federal government. Yeah, you know that's an excellent point, Chuck. And I I talk about that in my book because the deal is no, they couldn't make applications. They didn't have FEMA. They didn't have food stamps and welfare, and they didn't have big government uh, agencies that would step in. They didn't have Social Security or Medicare. It was uh, survive or die. And with the early church, it was take care of each other or die. All right, but all right, but but here's one of the problems. We've got some folk out there in the political arena that are teaching and preaching, so to speak, in a political way, that socialism and even communism is the ultimate expression of the New Testament and Christianity. That if we were really followers of Christ, if we were really New Testament Christians, we would uh, all sell everything that we have and put it in a common pot and have forced distribution, redistribution of wealth by some apostle or by some uh, dictator in the name of government. Yeah. Well, listen, excellent point, Chuck. I, okay. Again, I explode that myth in my book with a detailed study of the actual contextual Word of God. Those who would use the Word of God to make that claim are perverting it. They're doing violence to the truth and to mm-hmm. the context. Scripture, because the truth is, is that even Paul made it clear to Ananias and Sapphira, excuse me, Peter, made it clear to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, when they came to before him, Paul said, look, you know, wasn't it yours, wasn't your property yours to do with what you wished, wasn't mm-hmm. the money you received, it was yours to do with what you wished, right. so why did you lie to God, why did you lie to the church, why did you tell us you gave it all to the Lord when you didn't, mm-hmm. and so the point he was making, of course, he was dealing with their dishonesty and right. their attempt to be uh, important in the eyes of the people by lying and deception. But the point that he made is a very salient point. He said, look, it's always been yours. This is not a communistic society. Mm -hmm. We are simply voluntarily helping out our brothers and sisters. You made a pledge that you would do it, and then you lied and deceived the church. So the point being, as you study the scriptures, you discover that, yes, there were times when people would take what they had and sell it and take the the, the, the uh, proceeds and distribute it among those who had not because mm-hmm. brothers and sisters in Christ were losing their families, losing their jobs. They were losing their income and their support. And so the other ones took care of each other. But there was no mandate. There was no, no biblical uh, demand. There was no church demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, biblical, the biblical command is that we are to have a heart for each other, we are to take care of each other where we can, right. and we are to constantly be in a state of biblical, reasonable preparing. All and right. that's what the early church did. And that's exactly right, and it goes back to being prepared. Now, <clears throat> do you remember reading anywhere in the scriptures, Old or New Testament, where either Jesus or the apostles gave an instruction to eradicate poverty from the earth? Yeah. Now, Actually, no. In fact, Jesus said, you know, you will always have the poor with you. Right. So they, under, they they all understood that this was a blight of, upon the earth, an effect of sin, until Jesus returns again. This will happen. Now, that does not alleviate us from the responsibility of ministering to the poverty and to the hurts of the world. Exactly. But, but, yeah, but our primary responsibility is not to attempt to eradicate all poverty and all injustice, because it, it is here, and it is massively evil, and until the Lord returns. 
But we must go through, and I tell my church this. You know, I've pastored in one place for 29 years, and I say to them, look, here's the principle, folks. We cannot do everything in the world that needs to be done, but we can go through the doors that God opens for us. Mm -hmm. And when we do it, we do it faithfully, and we do it excellently, and that's why the body of Christ needs each other. We need to right. network. We need to be in cooperation with each other. Right, and we can do that. We can encourage one another, and we can also be together, as the Scripture says. Don't avoid the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, because you, as you see the day of the Lord approaching, you need to come together even the more so because of the exceeding deceitfulness of sin. So it's to encourage one another, but it's also to woo one another, to warn one another, uh, to uh, prepare one another. It's a one another business. And that brings up another issue that I alluded to a little earlier. Uh, when I read the scriptures, Carl, uh, I find the Apostle Paul addressing Timothy and Titus. These were two young men who were his ministry uh, cohorts. He was mentoring them. And he said, first of all, to Titus, he said, look, no one should be accepted into ministry leadership unless they be a lover of hospitality. Then he said to Timothy, and by the way, uh, no one should be uh, received into ministry leadership unless they be uh, given to hospitality. Then in Romans chapter 12, where he's describing the essence of the Christian faith in practical terms, he says, look, and every one of you, if you're truly a follower of Christ, is going to be given to hospitality. Not gifted in hospitality, but given to hospitality. I think that the attitude and heart and spirit of hospitality is going to be critical to be properly prepared for the difficult times coming. Yes, and not only did you speak beautiful, beautiful biblical truth, uh, but but the point that I try to make in my book very lovingly and very gently, but yet very pointedly, is look, the church in America has become too focused on itself. You know, mm -hmm. we've become an entitlement society. We think because Starbucks is open and the NFL game is on TV tonight and our favorite college team is playing, that all is right with the world. And as a matter of fact, all is not right with the world. There's intense suffering all over the world. Christians are being destroyed and persecuted in the Middle East and North Korea and China. Millions of them are in underground churches because they won't register with the government. And, and in the Sudan, and I mean, and now in America, you know, mm -hmm. Kim Davidson put in jail and in bakers and flower shop owners and and you know the pastors in houston that the that the mayor was threatened to put them in jail if, if they didn't supply her with the sermons they were preaching against her and on and on it goes yeah. and and so so we have got to wake up we have got to wake up brother chuck and we've as believers and understand that we've got to take care of each other we've got to we have to have a heart for hospitality a, a caring heart we've got to open our eyes see what's going on in the world around us and look for ways to minister to people to love people and to love them to jesus christ all right franklin graham as you know the son of evangelist billy graham uh, in a march 2015 fox news interview made this statement he said i believe we're going to see persecution in this country We've already seen many laws that have been uh, passed that restrict uh, freedom as Christians. It's going to get worse. And he said, we are losing our religious freedom, and we're losing it a little bit every single day. He said, the storm is coming. Friends, if you know the storm is coming, do you get prepared? Now, how do you prepare for persecution? We want to talk about that when we get back. It may not be something you want to hear, but it's something you need to hear because it's coming. Now, this is a wonderful book because it covers so many, many different things. It covers very practical issues, as you can see, that we've been talking about. And there's just no way we can begin to explore all the things that Carl has talked about in this book, Be Thou Prepared. But it's about equipping the church you and me for persecution and times of trouble, any kinds of trouble, hurricanes, disasters, natural and otherwise, whether or not they're acts of God, as the insurance company says, or acts of somebody else. In its early days, the Middle East, then called the Near East, 
the Middle East was the cradle of Christianity. And today we're being told that within five years there will be almost no Christians left in the Middle East. Did you hear that? We're talking about hundreds and thousands of millions of Christians that were in Iraq and Egypt and Syria, where people were first called Christians at Antioch in Syria. They're being cleansed from Turkey. They're being cleansed. Christians are being cleansed in massive spiritual genocide throughout the whole Middle East. And you don't think we have to prepare? In this segment, we want to talk about preparing the church for troubled times. How do we respond? How do we uh, deal with uh, persecution that is coming? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with attitude as well as actions. Uh, Give us your take on that, Carl. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, Brother Chuck. And and, and it's a complex issue. There are so many questions around it. And again, I, I... Try to deal with them all in my book. I, I, I can hit a few right now, mm-hmm. and and that is first of all, I, I tell Christians, well, how do you prepare for persecution? Well, first of all, you better get your heart right spiritually. You know, First Peter chapter three right. verse fifteen says, "In your heart, set apart Christ Jesus as Lord," <laughs> and then always be prepared to give the reason for the hope that is within you. But so also we says, there. having done all to stand, you better stand. Yeah, that's Ephesians 6.10. That's right. right. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can stand, and having done everything, to stand. And so so, uh, the Scripture is very clear about this. And so we prepare spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, of course, and all that's tied together when we start to prepare ourselves spiritually, biblically, for the possibility of persecution. And as you said, we're now seeing it beginning to unfold in America. Uh, Franklin Graham and I, and and he, of course, is is much more prolific than I am, but the two of us and, and many others have been screaming this message for years, and mm-hmm. some people kind of rolled their eyes at us, mm-hmm. but now here we are, and, and Christians are being persecuted in America yep. in, in, massive, in massive ways. They're being and we still haven't been raptured, have we? No, not yet. Now, that's coming, but I'm, what I'm trying to get across to American Christians is don't sit around saying, well, everything's lovely here. Uh, the rapture is going to deliver me. I'm not going to be persecuted. Well, mm-hmm. if you belong to Jesus Christ, there will come a day where the rapture delivers you. But in the meantime, the Bible also says we will endure yeah. persecution. Well, we the will. 20 guys that were lined up along the shore at uh, Tripoli in, in Libya and had their heads cut off because they were Christians didn't have a rapture deliver them. The 12 who had their uh, 12-year-old boy that had his fingers cut off in front of his daddy uh, so that his daddy would recant his Christian faith and turn to Islam, uh, the rapture didn't deliver him. The rapture didn't deliver his dad. Uh, when the son had was crucified by ISIS, uh, and then all of the other uh, people that were with them suffered the same fate. The women were raped. Uh, none of them was delivered by the rapture. Why is it in America we think that we're so privileged that we would never have to undergo anything like that? Well, I, you're right. It, we've had a cushy gospel of convenience uh, preached to us now for several hundred years, and as America has prospered and become the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, the, the, the largest economic engine, and the prosperity and the freedoms that we have enjoyed, and and the, and 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 it, what has happened is the church got fat and lazy, yeah. and we just kind of internalized that and said, well, you know, we must be awfully special, and, uh, <laughs> and of course, the, and the and the scripture does tell us there'll be a rapture, so we really don't have to worry about being persecuted because before, you know, before before really tough times come, mm-hmm. we're going to be raptured out. Well, here's the thing. The church, the, the Word of God speaks of the rapture of the church. Right. But I got news for Americans. The church is not relegated only to the shores of America. Our brothers and sisters in China and North Korea and the Middle East and, China, and, and Sudan and all these places, Egypt, Libya, everywhere you've just mentioned, these are our brothers and sisters, too. They are the church, too. And they and haven't they, been raptured out of the persecution exactly. in China. They haven't been raptured out of it in Sudan. They haven't been raptured out of it in Egypt or in Syria. Yes. 
Are you still there? I'm still here. Uh, I'm okay, kind of leaving okay. some I'm... pregnant silence there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. I thought I, I thought I had lost you. It ended so quickly. But no, no, you're absolutely right. You and you and I preach and scream the same thing, and that is, look, we're not trying to be alarmist. We are realist. We know what the Word of God says. We know what's happening in the world around us. We see the geopolitical, spiritual, social, demonic times in which we're living, the prophetic times, mm -hmm. and we're calling the church to wake up in America. And the reason tough times, I'm convinced, one of the reasons such tough times are coming to America now and persecution of Christians is because the church has been so fat and lazy, and we've been complacent. And, yeah. uh, and, and so now, you know, laws are changing. Uh, now we don't know what marriage is. Now we don't know when life begins. And now we don't know how to talk correctly. Or otherwise, we're politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, all of that is targeted at the church. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, a couple of decades ago, I told mm -hmm. the church that this was going to happen if we didn't wake up. Yeah, exactly. Now, let's shift again, because there's so much in your book. You cover a, uh, such a wide variety of issues about preparation. But let's talk about something that uh, it might be a little difficult for us to talk about, and that's the matter of uh, firearms and uh, uh, that kind of protection. Uh, many would say, well, you know, I, I wouldn't do that because uh, I'm trusting the Lord. Uh, on the other hand, uh, supposedly Israel is trusting God, but uh, they have soldiers marching with Uzis down every street. Uh, speak to us about that, will you? Yeah, no, listen, I could talk about this for hours, and I know we only have a few minutes, so I'm giving the very quick version. But look, our founding fathers understood. That's why we have a Second Amendment. They understood. Mm -hmm. If, if, if citizenry, and in our case, if Christians, if believers cannot defend themselves, if we are totally defenseless, then we are doomed to destruction and enslavement. Uh, we saw that in the Holocaust with Jews in Nazi Germany after Germany was kind of disarmed, and especially the undesirable populations, they were disarmed. Mm -hmm. And after that disarmament, we saw it with Pol Pots and, and China and, 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 and other regimes around the world. Whenever in North Korea, whenever you disarm, when you can disarm a population, you can then enslave them and control them and destroy them. Our founding fathers knew that. That's why they made that such a stalwart part of, of who we are. Now, we get to the Word of God, because that's more important than even the Constitution, sure. of course. Uh, yeah, and, and the Word of God is clear. I mean, all the way back to Nehemiah's day, when they were back building the walls of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and Nehemiah instructed the men, he says, you know, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he says, get a spear in one hand and put a shovel in the other, yeah. and defend your families, defend your lives, defend this wall, and let's do the work of God. So built we the wall with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Exactly. And he, and he told them, if you don't do this, then you will be destroyed, you and your families. Because the bottom line truth is, Brother Chuck, as you know, and most of your listeners know this, is evil is real. And the world is filled with evil that desires to destroy, to destroy the people of God. So for a Christian who says, well, you know, I'm just not going to get into all that self-defense stuff, and I'm not going to worry about having a firearm or any kind of self-defense, and, you know, I'm just trusting God, or I'm going to turn the other cheek. Yeah, I was going to bring say, that up. Where does yeah. that come in here? Yeah, well, first of all, let's take, I'm going to give a practical illustration, but let me address it biblically. First of all, it's taking the scriptures out of context to apply mm -hmm. that to a matter of self-defense, and it's particularly where you are charged by scripture to defend the innocent ones around you and your family, your children and, and, and elderly and loved ones. Uh, but, but when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, he was talking about the day-to-day existence of Christians, ministering in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a world that's antagonistic, we are not to go around with our chest boat out looking for a fight every day. Mm -hmm. We are to, to be as, be as uh, peaceful and peace-seeking as possible. We are to, you know, turn the other cheek. Somebody insults us, just keep going. Don't strike back. Don't lash back. Right. Turn the other cheek, so to speak, and keep going. That's the context. But I say to Christians who say, well, you know, I'm just not going to worry about the self-defense stuff. You know, we're, we're called to turn the other cheek. And I say to them, really? So tonight at 3 o'clock in the morning, if three or four thugs kick down your front door, they've got machetes and baseball bats, and they're going to walk down the hall to where your little two- and three-year-old children are, and they're going to have their way with your kids. 
you're going to stop in the living room and give them a cup of coffee and say, look, we're going to turn the other cheek. You just do whatever you want. I don't think so. I think that at that point, you have a biblical responsibility to defend the lives of the innocent ones around you and to protect your own life because your life is valuable to your little children as well. And the scriptures are filled with examples of this. Jesus himself told his own disciples on the night that he was getting ready before he was going to be crucified, he told them, he said, look, if you don't have a sword, he said, I would advise you to buy one now. Yep. You know, tough, tough times are coming. Now, well, he didn't mean to go get it and overthrow the government. He right. meant be prepared to protect yourself and your family. Times he, are going to get tough. Because he also said that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So sure. uh, we've got to put these things in proper and righteous balance. And I, I think that you've tried to do that uh, in your book, Carl, and also in our conversation here. There's so much uh, to be talked about, and I, I think you've you've dealt with it uh, uh, masterfully here uh, in your book. You talk about even a church security t- a ministry team. Uh, I start getting a little uh, nervous when I see what's going on in our churches, and you know, people uh, open carrying or secretly carrying a, a firearm in, into the churches to try to deal pastors in the pulpits and so on. Uh, this is becoming a very, very dangerous, dangerous world. And I think an awful lot of uh, our response here is not just what we do, it's the attitude with which we do it. And that's why right up front in the program, I said it's not just about our actions, it's about our attitudes. And uh, God is every bit as concerned about our attitudes as he is about our actions. Ultimately, uh, you have provided uh, some checklists here in your book. You have tried to be as uh, careful as you could. You've provided uh, church benevolence information and forms about how to minister according to the Scripture. Uh, I mean, you've covered, covered the waterfront here, Carl. And uh, I appreciate the labors that you have put forth. You've put forth labors previously in trying to uh, warn the body of Christ, and we need to do that. In this book, you're wooing the body of Christ to be prepared. Be thou prepared, friends, equipping the church for persecution and times of trouble. It's tough talk for troubled times. Uh, that's, That's unfortunately what it is, but we need to be ready.